Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, again, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's an excellent experience for myself. Um, I've been involved in Canadian Bioinformatic Workshops for uh, three years now, and it's been really a uh, very um, educating experience. Um, so um, I welcome you to the last day of the course, which will be devoted to the uh, clinical omics. And yes, I will uh, describe a little bit who I am. And I am um, a research scientist at the Vancouver Prostate Center at this moment. I joined the center a couple years ago. I have um, moved from California, where I worked for about eight years on breast and ovarian cancers, first with the uh, University of California in San Francisco, and then um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And uh, so my focus is the analysis of high throughput, high resolution data, including microarrays, and more so recently, high um, um, the next generation sequencing technology, in particular RNA-seq data, uh, with a focus on the development of biomarkers and new therapeutic targets. So um, what's interesting about me, um, I don't know, I actually particularly find it um, uh, fascinating to um, change fields and uh, change directions. I think um, it, it's really a shame to stick to any single direction and not to explore anything else around you in this world. So during my professional career, I, I have changed my direction two times. And my uh, background is in chemistry. I have graduated a chemical department uh, of the Moscow State University. And then I switched to molecular biology. And then I decided that I want to switch to another thing, and that was the bioinformatics which was completely different um, uh, in terms of the uh, set of skills and uh, paradigm and um, understanding of things and background and applications. It was, it was actually a way bigger shift for myself than switch from chemistry to molecular biology. So that's who I am. And just to s emphasize, I am a uh, computational biologist, as I like to call myself, not a bioinformatician but a computational biologist. And yes, there is a distinction between the two. Uh, bioinformatics is more, um, uh, is, um, involves a um, heavy duty algorithm development, whereas computational biology um, focuses more on the application of algorithms to um, resolve any biological questions at hand. And so that's what I do. and. Um, uh, thus, you will hear my presentation today, and you will see that um, the focus of my presentation will be more onto the application and the impact on the research question and further downstream translational impact um, and so on. So, um, so we'll start with, um, so this is the module 8, and it consists of two parts. Uh, the first part will be devoted to clinical data um, and development of markers, um, uh, discrimination and classification problems, and introduction to the clinical omics. And the second part will be devoted to the uh, analysis of clinical data, and in particular, survival analysis. So um, this is, again, just as I said, module Eight part one uh, will have two parts again, the introduction, and then uh, the part two, which will include um, from molecular profiles to classification and predictions and markers of drug response as a specific um, um, area of research um, under this umbrella. So um, I will start with um, this first slide which basically gives you a definition of biomarkers and therapeutic targets. So uh, biomarker is a biological molecule found in blood, other body fluids, or tissues that is a sign of a normal or abnormal process or of a condition of disease. A biomarker may be used to see or predict how well the body responds to treatment for disease or condition also called molecular marker and signature molecule. 
Now, uh, to remind you what the therapeutic target is. It's a biological molecule, an enzyme or receptor or other protein that can be modified by an external stimulus. And the application, the implication is that a molecule is hit by signal and its behavior is thereby changed. So um, the pharmacogenetics is the study. Um, I will start actually with the pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics because this is basically um, this is the roots of um, what we will be talking today about. And pharmacogenetics is the study of the role of inheritance in variation in drug response phenotypes. Those phenotypes can range, you can see here, there's a whole spectrum. Oh, it's so faint. Can you see my... Okay, that's good. So uh, we have the whole spectrum of uh, response to a drug treatment, and it can range from life-threatening adverse effects um, at one end of the spectrum to um, uh, the lack of the therapeutic efficacy on the other side of the spectrum, which is equally serious. Over the past half century, pharmacogenetics has, like all um, of medical genetics, evolved from a discipline with a focus on uh, monogenic traits to become pharmacogenomics with a genome-wide perspective. So uh, the earliest experimentally validated example um, of an effect of inheritance of drug response um, were first reported a long time ago, more than a half of a century ago, in 1950s and 1960s. And then uh, researchers have noted the large differences in response to a standard drug doses. So the story of the short-acting uh, muscle relaxant here, I'm sorry, here, um, which is hydrolyzed by an enzyme, BCHE, uh, served as an early stimulus uh, for the development of pharmacogenetics. And it was observed that a common genetic variation in um, drug metabolism, I'm sorry, could result in striking differences in the half-life and plasma concentrations of drugs metabolized by that particular enzyme. So, and this enzyme actually uh, metabolizes a number of different drugs. And it was found that approximately 1 in 3,500 individuals, there is a homozygous um, state for a gene encoding um, an atypical form of that enzyme, which um, uh, is translated into relatively um, inactive enzyme, which is unable to hydrolyze this drug. And thus, um, the drug-induced muscle paralysis is prolonged, and this is a serious side effect. <coughs> Almost at the same time, uh, the drug Isoniazid, one of the first effective drugs for treating tuberculosis, was developed, and um, it followed by the observation that plasma concentration of this drug showed a uh, bimodal distribution after administration of the identical doses to uh, different subjects. Um, and then it was found that it was due to the uh, different activity of the enzyme which is encoded by gene NAT2 that was responsible for this spectrum of response in different patients. So these examples served as a stimulus for a series of um, further studies, um, which mostly focused on alterations in um, drugs pharmacokinetics. And this uh, resulted um, basically uh, from the pursuit of clinical observations of an adverse drug responses. So, um, and basically, um, this was a typical phenotype to genotype research strategy widely used in human genetics. Uh, but following examples um, that I will show you uh, are the landmarks of the field which mark the transition from the biochemical to uh, molecular pharmacogenetics. So um, one of the um, pretty typical examples of this era 
that have become um, basically pharmacogenetic icons uh, is um, and the example that also bridged the, this transition from biochemical to molecular pharmacogenetics was the story of the sip 2 d 6 um, which is a, a cytochrome P450 family um, drug metabolizing enzymes. Uh, sip 2 d 6 uh, catalyzes by transformation of many of drugs, including antidepressants and antiarrhythmic drugs, and it also activates analgesic prodrug codeine, which is widely used. Um, then it, it was found that a genetic variation um, within this gene was basically influencing the um, um, response to this drug in any given patient. Um, a number of um, variations were found within this gene, including non-synonymous coding SNP that was associated with a decreased activity of the enzyme, gene deletion, and uh, on the other spectrum, uh, it was found that gene was also duplicated up to 13 copies, uh, resulting in the increased activity of this enzyme in a particular patient. So this slide now uh, shows the frequency uh, distribution uh, in northern European population uh, that included a group of four metabolizers. They are, sh sorry, they are shown here in red. Four metabolizers, and this is measured as a ratio of a drug to its metabolite. Then another subgroup was the extensive metabolizers. This was a major group. And the group of ultra-rapid metabolizers. And so um, um, it was uh, subsequently shown, as I mentioned, that poor metabolizers contain inactivating <laughs> coding SNP or gene deletion, and um, resulting in a decrease in activity of this enzyme. And um, the ultra-rapid metabolizers uh, often contain gene duplication, increasing the activity of that enzyme significantly. So, so now it is clear from this story that uh, poor metabolizers um, may have excessive drug effect with drugs that are inactivated by this uh, enzyme, and inadequate drug effect with drugs that are activated by this enzyme. For example, codeine that is um, transformed by this enzyme to morphine. So codeine will be ineffective in this group of patients. And uh, on the other side of the spectrum, ultra-rapid metab metabolizers uh, would um, show inadequate therapeutic response to drugs inactivated by this enzyme. And at the same time, excessive drug effect with uh, side effects with drugs that are activated. So for instance, in, in the case of codeine, that can <coughs> lead to a very serious side effects, including respiratory arrest after treatment with standard uh, doses of codeine. So um, now it's becoming increasingly evident that most human diseases and response to inappropriate therapy are governed by many factors. And in the era of pharmacogenetics, the main focus now uh, is um, on the individual drug metabolizing enzyme, most of the times as I illustrated in my previous example. Um, however, the brutal fact is that even if we uh, do find an aberration responsible for um, any given response. Still, um, it is almost never explains all 100% of cases. And there are got to be other contributing factors. And with the following examples, I will show you the necessity of evolution from pharmacogenetics to pharmacogenomics. So this is a warfarin story <coughs> that I will highlight for you. Uh, warfarin is the um, common drug that is most widely prescribed uh, oral anticoagulant. And it has serious adverse effects, which uh, include hemorrhage and undesired coagulation. 
uh, warfarin is predominantly metabolized by cytochrome P450 family member CYP2C9. It was found that two common polymorphisms are associated with decreased activity of CYP2C9. And those polymorphisms um, were responsible for reduction in activity of that enzyme down to 12 and 5 percent of the wild type <coughs> respectively, which is a huge decrease. But then the frequency of those polymorphisms were only about 10 percent each of them. Um, so obviously, this pharmacokinetic genetic variation did not explain most of the variance in response. And the target for an this warfarin or anticoagulant drug um, had remained pretty much unknown for quite a long time until recently, uh, in about 2004, when the gene VCORC1 was um, detected as a target and it was cloned and resequenced by many laboratories. And in that case, no uh, non-synonymous uh, coding SNPs were observed, um, but a series of haplotypes were observed that were associated with the final dose of warfarin. So um, now this is an example. This example represents probably in a simplified form the type of polygenic model that uh, we expect to observe uh, in the future with uh, increasing frequency. And as I said, the focus in pharmacogenomic studies, unfortunately, is on pharmacokinetic pathways, which are the um, uh, drug metabolizing enzymes and associated pathways, such as C2C9 uh, in case of warfarin, um, and C2C6, C2C6 as well. Um, so, and also the transporters that can um, influence the final concentration of drug that um, m might reach the target. So this is called the pharmacokinetic uh, factors. But also there is a pharmacodynamic pathways that include the drug target as well as uh, signaling cascades downstream of that target. And in this case, this would be exemplified by the VCORC1 uh, gene for the warfarin. So cancer, which is a topic of our course, is certainly the ultimate example of a polygenic disease with many genes involved. The complexity of molecular biology of cancer stems from the fact that um, in addition to polygenic nature, mutations in a broad sense of the word uh, take place on all levels. And this includes genomic aberration, um, uh, mutations, uh, transcriptional changes, splicing changes, post-transcriptional modifications, epigenetic changes, changes on the protein level. And so basically um, modern technologies enable screening for all types of mutations from all these levels, which all of which can be used as potential biomarkers. So this slide demonstrates how complex may be a single amplicon in cancer. We all know that um, the um, most typical genomic aberration in cancer are amplifications together with deletions. So what are these amplicons and um, what's, what's the structure of those amplicons? And this slide shows a um, frequent and high level amplification on chromosome 20Q13 from breast cancer. And as you can see, um, this amplicon, when it was sequenced um, uh, pretty thoroughly, uh, was shown to be comprised of many segments from distant uh, locations in the human genome, which were concatenated together. You see that there are pieces of chromosome 3, um, several pieces from chromosome uh, 20, from different bands, from Q-arm, and they were all concatenated together. <coughs> so uh, the important outcome of this is um, basically an alteration of gene expression. It can be um, a result of either juxtaposition of regulatory sequences of um, one 
region of the genome with the gene that originates from a completely different uh, region of the genome. And this may um, change the expression level of that particular gene. Or it can cause um, creation of fusion transcripts, um, or which may um, have altered um, functional uh, role. Or uh, it can result in inactivation of a certain uh, gene by creating a breakpoint and, say, introducing a premature stop codon and so um, eliciting the nonsense-mediated decay, for example, of that gene, a truncated transcript. So, but basically this, uh, this example emphasizes one of the greatest challenges in cancer genomics, to reconstruct cancer genome and transcript home. This is now becoming possible um, with uh, the wide application of high-throughput sequencing technology. So, gene expression profiles have been widely used for development of expression-based biomarkers. Um, this is the expression pattern of breast cancers, um, which probably um, you have seen um, from the early days of this course, um, with a number of distinct <coughs> subtypes identified, including basal, luminal subtype, and ERBI2. Expression signatures of these subtypes can be used uh, to discriminate subtypes of cancers, uh, which in turn have distinct clinical uh, outcomes. And yes, there is a number of examples of successful application of um, um, uh, classification um, to um, gene expression profiles of a number of cancer types. But then it is also uh, been observed by many groups that integration of different levels of mutations that I mentioned above, such as gene expression and genome copy number, can increase our power in development um, of biomarkers. And in this case, this is again um, about breast cancer. Um, in addition to the expression subtypes of breast cancers with uh, different clinical outcome, um, which is shown here. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve for all those expression-based subtypes, including luminal A, B, basal, and ERB2. Um, basically, um, um, it was found that also, in addition to these expression-based subtypes, there is also genome copy number-based um, uh, subgroups of um, luminal A cancers amplifiers, which are shown here. This is a heat map of copy number changes uh, within uh, cancers, luminal uh, cancers. These are amplifiers versus non-amplifiers. And it was shown that they also have different um, clinical outcome, as shown by kaplan Meyer curve here. So uh, it seems to be beneficial to integrate uh, molecular profiles for biomarker discovery. Uh, which um, now is basically an actively developing area of bioinformatics research. So now I want to highlight a HER2 and trastuzumab or Herceptin story for you because this is probably one of the brightest examples of going from molecular profiling of cancers to clinical applications. So ERB2, or HER2 receptor, is a cell surface receptor of tyrosine kinase, a member of the ERB family. It was shown that overexpression results in activation of intracellular signaling through the ras raf map and ERK um, cascade and PA3 kinase AKT cascade to promote cell division, proliferation, and inhibit apoptosis. In 1987, uh, Slamon published a study um, in science on HER2 where they, the authors have shown that uh, this gene was overexpressed up to 20 copies in 25 to 30 percent of breast cancers. And it was associated with shorter survival and relapse times. So um, soon after that, in 1990, Genentech develops a humanized monoclonal antibody against HER2 receptor. And it was really an incredible uh, work that was accomplished within a year, and it's really outstanding um, achievement. And then Genentech has tested this um, antibody 
in a, um, a cohort of samples with no regard to the ERB2 status. And what they have found is that it was effective only in a few percent of patients. And then uh, it occurred that basically um, the antibody against ERB2 should be more effective in patients with ERB2 amplification, or so-called ERB2 positive. And, and so after realization of this, in 1992, clinical trials have commenced. and. Now it is a standard of care, um, a combination of test for HER2 expression status and an application of Herceptin in combination with um, other drugs. So this graph shows the efficacy of the Herceptin drug alone in yellow color and in combination with other drugs. This is a statistics from um, a number of clinical trials um, over the years. So what you can see that the response rate right here in the y-axis uh, for the Herceptin alone was relatively low, even for the HER2 positive cancers. But at the same time, um, in combination therapy, the rate has significantly increased. And this is the blue bars. So the response rate was achieved um, that was as high as 69% there, which was a significant achievement and huge success. So the number of studies devoted to the detection of development of biomarkers of cancer that we see being published every day is, is really daunting. Over the last decades, hundreds and hundreds of studies have been published showing um, um, the you know, a wide range of promising biomarkers with really um, reasonable and relatively high accuracy, nice sensitivity, and so on and so forth. So how well can we actually manage cancer today? I think it is very um, educating to um, look at the statistics on cancer incidence and mortality. And this data comes from the Canadian Cancer Society. This is, um, in particular, uh, the statistics for 2009. So here in this slide, you see a um, dynamic of the incidence rate on the left and the mortality rate for um, individual cancer types in men. And I just want to highlight two examples for you of prostate and lung cancer. So um, for prostate cancer, uh, with the advent of a PSA screen in 1993, more and more early stage cancers could be detected, which uh, resulted in a, this spike um, of the incidence rate. Then it was rapidly realized that the higher PSA is not always translatable to a malignant disease. So hence, we can see a slight decline in, in this uh, incident, uh, incidence rate for the next couple of years. However, the mortality did not change much. It's shown right here. So it's from, uh, what, 1980 um, to um, 2009. So the mortality is not really changing. And the advent of the PSA test didn't really change the situation much. And the reason for that is that we still are not doing a great job um, in detecting really aggressive cancers that are lethal. So but for the lung cancer, this is um, another example which is um, uh, particularly curious, I think. You see that both incidence and mortality uh, are going down over these years. And this is most likely attributed to the recognition of the risk factors, such as smoking, which influenced the awareness within men population who just simply stopped smoking. And so that's why we see the decline for lung cancer in particular. So this is the situation in women. So uh, the introduction. Um, and I will uh, just highlight a couple of uh, uh, cancer types, including breast and lung. 
So the introduction of the mammography was a milestone for breast cancer management, providing means to detect cancers on the earlier stage, which is um, a way more curable than the late stage disease. And indeed, the mortality rate went down a bit, but still breast cancer is really um, far from being eradicated. And this is, again, because we're still missing a great proportion of highly aggressive cancers. We do not have a um, really robust markers for aggressive cancers that we can apply in clinic and predict patients with a particularly poor outcome. So, and again, um, the uh, funny statistics, I find it funny actually a bit, uh, for lung cancer, as you can see, um, unlike men, for women, lung cancer incidence, both incidence and mortality, uh, is increasing over years and quite significantly. And this can actually be explained by more, let's say, you know, social factor, um, um, by a uh, feminization that has been taking place since 1980 and on. And so despite all of the awareness of the smoking as a risk factor, women just choose to smoke. So now this is the um, summarized statistics for men and women for all cancers. And what you can see here uh, on top now you see the incidence rate and at the bottom you see the mortality rate. So again, this is the actual curve, the very top one is the actual curve. But then we need to adjust for aging population and for the population growth. And the, the lowest curve would be the resulted corrected curve, which will um, show us how we uh, do with uh, management of cancer. And so what you can see here is for men, you see a slight, um, you know, an increase in uh, incidence um, and um, a minor decrease in mortality. And again, this most likely is attributed to both prostate cancer and lung cancer, which I illustrated in my earlier slides. For women, the incidence uh, has gone up over the years and the mortality stayed about the same over these years. So obviously, we still have not conquered cancer. And yes, there is a keen need in novel prognostic and therapeutic biomarkers, which I will be covering in the next section. Um, that's why we have um, this course. So I don't know how would you like to proceed. Um, I have my break. Oh, lunch at 1230. Okay, so then I think we should uh, go ahead and continue. So now uh, we are moving to the next part of the module um, 8, part 1, which is uh, devoted um, to the development of um, my mark biomarkers using molecular profiles. So there are three main statistical problems in tumor classification. And that includes identification of new or unknown classes using molecular profiles. And that would be called unsupervised learning. Another type is the classification into known classes. And that will be the discrimination analysis or supervised learning. And the third task is the identification of markers or genes that characterize classes. And that would be a variable selection. So for example, just to give you an example, uh, for the first bullet, the unsupervised learning, you are given a set of samples with uh, molecular characterization with, say, gene expression profiles using F-matrix uh, microarray. And the goal is to um, find possible uh, molecular subgroups 
that um, can be characterized by specific molecular signatures of gene expression. And the usual way of going would be um, to uh, perform an unsupervised hierarchical clustering that you have probably heard about uh, during this course, find novel subgroups, and then um, move, um, proceed with um, uh, downstream further analysis of some kind. So that will be an unsupervised learning. Now, what we will concentrate in this part of the module is the uh, classification into known classes and identification of markers that characterize classes. So, for example, you are given the group of patients uh, who respond to the given therapy and the other group of patients who do not respond to therapy. And now we need to find um, a, uh, markers of response to this therapy. So, we need to um, we need to um, uh, do a good job at discriminating these two subgroups of patients using their molecular profiles. This is called the discrimination analysis or supervised learning. And then we will need to find a features or genes that best characterize each class. That will be a variable selection or building our predictive markers or building classifier. And then once we have this we can apply those uh, biomarkers that we have built on our given uh, groups of patients to an independent group of patients and try to predict their response without knowing the actual response. So that will be the focus of this part of the uh, module. So what is the discrimination and prediction and how it's done? So uh, basically, we start with expression profiles of group of samples or patients that you can see here. Some of them uh, exhibit poor response to the drug and the group of patients who have good response to uh, a given drug. So now, uh, using these expression profiles, we build a classifier which is now a set of genes, which expression pattern describes these two groups the best. So this is the classifier. So this would be um, basically, um, um, it will be summarized, uh, that um, the, the expression will be summarized in, in this way, so it's more of a, you know, black and white, um, so, uh, say these genes are upregulated and these genes are downregulated. So, again, the classifier is not a single gene, it's a set of genes. So, and then uh, this classifier basically is applied to a new patient for which we can predict what would be the most likely response to the same drug. So, now this part of this uh, procedure is called discrimination. And this part is called prediction. So now, um, for a building classifier, we need a so-called classification rule. And this classification rule is composed of two components, uh, feature selection and classification methods. So there is a great number of different classification algorithms out there, probably about a hundred of them. Um, now these that I'm showing on this slide are most commonly used ones, and I will not describe them in detail. I will show you rather a comparison, and if you want to understand the details behind these algorithms, I will refer you to a very nice detailed paper in the end that uh, I would suggest you to read if you are to move into this research direction. So the common algorithms include uh, linear discriminant analysis, or commonly referred to as LDA. Uh, then uh, there is a maximum likelihood discriminant rules and nearest neighbor classifiers, KNN, which is very popular as well. There is also classification trees or carts, and then there is an aggregating classifiers which involve bagging and boosting approaches. 
And in the end, in blue, you see the neural networks and support vector machines, which are um, slightly different from the rest in terms of the complexity. So these are a way more uh, computationally complex approaches, which require uh, more um, extensive bioinformatic uh, training. But people um, mostly use simple methods that I describe here in, and show in black font, uh, with KNN um, being one of the popular ones, including the support vector machines. Yes? Yeah. So, so see, um, this is. So we need to build a classifier. How do we do this? We take a molecular profiling data, right? We need to uh, we need to reduce the dimensionality because we have some thirty five thousand genes, right? Um, so we slightly reduce the dimensionality, and and I will show you that uh, there is a specific um, strategy for doing this step. And then uh, whatever you end up with is your matrix of data. And then you need a, an algorithm that would take that data and build a classifier for you. And the methods that I listed down there are basically the classification methods, which are used on um, the selected features. And together, they comprise a classification rule. This is something that you will be uh, hearing and seeing in the literature. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, great. Okay. So I think that's the question is that Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So filtering the noise and etc. Yes, this is this is done under the feature selection. Was it referred as a feature selection as well? No, no I see. So unfortunately, there is you know um, there is no a common set of terms that are commonly used, and there are different terms. So it's good that you ask this question so that you can put it in the context of the material that you have learned already. So. Um, so there was this very nice paper published in 2002 that compared uh, a number of discrimination methods uh, for classification in tumors using gene expression data. And I will um, uh, suggest you to read through this paper if you want to familiarize yourself with, uh, uh, with details of these algorithms. But uh, uh, what I think is uh, important is the message of this paper, as you can see there, that Ken and uh, Nears Neighbors and um, uh, LDA approach had the smallest error rates. Uh, these are the simpler methods. And then another one uh, was the aggregation improved the performance of CART classifiers. So these pertain the comparison of different methods. And before you move into this research um, uh, direction, you should read through the paper. So now I will describe to you um, the first component of a classification rule, the feature selection. So now a classification algorithm should decide how well a feature discriminates classes. Uh, so the goal now of the feature selection is to reduce noise. And there are three main uh, classes of uh, feature selection strategies. Um, the first one is the filter method, um, where usually one um, scores features or genes independently. Then they are ranked, and top n are selected. Scores may be uh, between group two, within group variation measure. It can be t statistics. It can be p value. So, um, so again, you start with two groups of your patients, and then. You, uh, you, you score each individual gene on your list. But there are a number of problems um, associated with this type of uh, feature selection. Problem one is the redundancy. And that is um, because features are selected independently 
without assessing if they contribute to new information. Uh, now, problem two is the fact that interactions between genes are not considered. And yet another problem uh, is that cl classification method itself does not take part in feature selection, whereas it should. Now, wrapper methods is another class. Um, this is an iterative approach, uh, classification performance um, of many subsets of features. That's what constitutes this. And then select the best performing ones. The downside is, is that uh, wrapper methods are computationally intensive and they are easy to overfit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. So um, after we reduce the technical noise, um, we still um, end up with quite big number of genes, right? And so not all of them are certainly associated with the drug uh, with with any given class, right? So um, and um, basically. Um, we want to remove those that are not associated. And that's, yeah, this is a very good point. So this is kind of noise I'm referring to. Thank you. And the last one is the embedded methods, uh, which perform um, classification and feature selection simultaneously. And this certainly improves the classification accuracy. Examples of uh, such methods uh, include uh, KNN and LDA. So now this slide, um, in part, uh, answers the question of yours, Michelle. Uh, it illustrates the filtering method of feature selection. So this is a correlation matrix that you see of a cohort of um, samples, um, which are represented by three groups, one, two, three here, and one, two, three there. So now on the left, you see the correlation for all of the genes. In that case, it was 3,500 genes. And as you can see, the correlation is pretty low. Then if we filter out genes with low differential expression between groups, then as one may expect, we get better correlation. And that's the graph on the right. And this is the subset of genes that we want to subselect for building our classifier. These describe groups the best. They are associated with uh, characteristics of these groups of samples and are most informative in describing these groups. So now, um, what's the purpose of the feature selection component to improve classification performance by removing genes that are not associated with outcome? And in this case, this is noise, unfortunately the same term. Now, they may also, um, the filtering uh, step may also lead to useful insights into the biology of the disease. So differentially expressed genes between groups may infer on possible pathways involved and uh, um, biological processes. And then it can also lead to the diagnostic tests, such as breast cancer chip, that will contain genes that are significantly differentially expressed between, say, um, uh, aggressive cancers versus non-aggressive cancers in the ideal case. So now, uh, this slide now shows the basic components of the procedure of building and evaluating the classifier. So what you can see here is that we start with the learning or training set of samples with the molecular profiles. And then um, within that learning set, we have, say, two subgroups of patients, say, responders versus non-respondents to any given therapy. So now, using this training set, applying classification rule, we end up with a classifier 
which then has to be tested on independent test set, which is completely uh, another set of samples with similar molecular profiles, um, ideally with the same platform. And uh, basically, uh, we evaluate the performance of this classifier on the independent test set. And we do the same, actually, uh, for, this, for the learning set. And from here, we get an error rate. And from um, testing classifier on the independent set, we also get an error rate. And these uh, fit into the performance assessment. So now this is the ideal case where we have independent learning or training set and independent test set. Uh, but unfortunately, independent sets of samples are really rarely available and almost never at the time of the current study. So what do we do in such circumstances? Uh, a way more often what researcher is presented with is a single set which we have to split in certain proportion into training set and test set. And in this case, this test set will not be ideally independent, although, um, although this will be a you know, sort of a surrogate of independent test set. And then we go through the same procedure of building classifier using the learning set and then evaluating its performance on the test set that we set aside. And then we get error rates from here and evaluate the performance. Now, the downside of this scenario, unfortunately, is that uh, we end up with a reduction of effective sample size. So, for example, we have a set of some 50 samples, and you're forced to um, split them into test set and um, training set. And so you are effectively reducing this to, say, 25 here and 25 there, or 30 here and 20 there. So this is a downside, but this happens quite often. Now, the essential part of the classification procedure is the performance assessment. And it consists of the following components. Um, how accurate is a uh, classifier? And for that purpose, we use a confusion matrix and a number of metrics that can be derived from confusion matrix, including accuracy. Another question is how well classifier worked on learning set, and that would be a resubstitution error rate that I showed you on the diagram on the previous slide. And how well classifier worked on test set, that will be a test set error rate. Another very important component are cross validation, which I will describe in a minute. And then um, another component is how do different classifiers compare to each other? And for that, we would be using rock curves. So now, what is the confusion matrix? So confusion matrix is a visualization tool typically used in supervised learning, such as our case. Columns represent the instances in the actual class here. So this is our actual class. This is our predicted class. These are rows. So just to tell you up front that one benefit of the confusion matrix is that it is very easy to see if the system or our classifier is confusing two classes. That's the name of that, a confusion matrix. Uh, confuses or incorrectly um, labels um, samples as one class or the other class. Now, um, the, the matrix is, uh, has a dimension of n by n, and n meaning the number of groups. In this, this is the simplest case where we have, for example, the um, 
the um, group of patients, say, that were evaluated by the pathologist uh, with regard to the presence or absence of cancer. So within this group, which will be, say, our golden standard uh, diagnostic technique, we had this number of positive patients and this number of negative patients. Then we apply our biomarker here to the same cohort of patients. And, and then we get this number of positives and this number of negatives according to our um, classifier, our test. And then we see what's the overlapping number between these, between golden standard, the actual class, and between the predicted class. So these would be true positives. These are patients who were correctly uh, diagnosed as positive. And these would be false negatives because they were predicted as positive by our test, but in the reality they're negative. And likewise, true negatives that were correctly predicted as negative and false negatives that were incorrectly predicted um, as um, negatives. So now, how do we use this confusion matrix? A number of statistics can be derived from, from this matrix. Uh, and um, there are at least four statistics um, that I will refer to. And they are shown in blue here. Just to, to tell you upfront, there is a common, there it, it's actually quite simple to understand how we derive this um, statistics from the table. These are simply a ratios of these red colors. Um, uh, I'm sorry, a fraction of the number of true positives here, for example, to the sum of this column. The same for the specificity. Specificity would be a fraction of true negatives of the sum of this column. And then, likewise, positive predictive uh, uh, value or rate and negative predicted value uh, would be calculated as a fraction of true negatives as a sum of this row. And positive predictive value, a fraction of true positives as uh, from the sum of this column. Is it clear now? Yeah. So, actually, uh, the confusion matrix is quite handy in this regard. You do not need to remember um, the formula for these metrics, but you can just construct the confusion matrix and easily derive your metrics from here. Now, a very important uh, metric is the accuracy. And the accuracy is defined by this formula. It can be um, defined through true positives and true negatives, or it can be um, defined through uh, sensitivity and specificity. Just to mention that um, uh, positive predictive value and negative predicted value are clinically relevant uh, metrics, and they are um, more valuable in evaluating other performance of classifiers compared to sensitivity and specificity. So now this slide shows you an example with actual numbers. So in this case, we are applying a new test, folk test, to a um, cohort of patients with bowel cancer that were diagnosed with endoscopy. So here you see uh, the number of positives and negatives are not shown here, but uh, this is the overlap. So the number of true positives is this, false negatives is one. So the sensitivity would be true positives divided by the sum of true positives and false negatives, and this would be 66%. Specificity, similarly, is um, uh, true negatives divided by uh, the sum of false positives and true negatives, and the, this uh, is 91%. And similarly, um, here the positive predictive value is, um, uh, is this one. And negative predictive value is this one. It's 99%. So now, 
what is the misclassification error rates that I have shown you on the diagram before? The error rates that are used to evaluate the performance of classifier. So it is simple um, as one minus accuracy for any given confusion matrix. So, so you build a classifier and then you um, you you apply classifier to a learning set, the same learning set, and you get a confusion matrix. And out of that, you can calculate um, accuracy. And one minus accuracy would be our resubstitution error rate that I showed you before. And then when a classifier is applied to our test set, again, we get a confusion matrix from which we get an accuracy, and one minus accuracy would be our test set error rate. Now, I will tell you about the cross-validation, which is an important internal validation of a classifier. And it is performed on a training set. So uh, there is a V-fold cross-validation, which is a general um, type of cross-validation. Uh, and that is when cases in a learning set randomly divided into V subsets of nearly equal size. Then we leave one set out and it will constitute a surrogate test set for us and the rest are used um, as a learning set for building classifier. Then we, uh, we evaluate the performance of classifier on one subset that was left out we compute test set error rates, and then we repeat this exercise over all V sets. And then we average the error rate. This is the essence of cross-validation. Mm -hmm. Now, the leave one out cross-validation is a special case of a V-fold cross-validation, where V is equal to N, and N is the number of samples in our set. So basically, we at each given iteration, we leave one sample out. We use the rest for building classifier, and then we apply classifier to the one that was left out. And we reiterate this process n times. So this is the essence. Uh, now, there is a um, one note that I want to to say is that there is a bias variance trade-off. So the smaller V can give larger bias, but smaller variance. And so um, it is computationally intensive if you increase V. Uh, this one? So um, is this part clear for you? The upper part is clear for you, right? So the leave one out cross validation is a special case of just v-fold cross-validation, where v is ba uh, so the subset is basically composed of a single sample. So you have 100 samples. You take one out, you build a classifier on 99 of them, and then you evaluate it on the, uh, on the hundredth one that you left out. And then you reiterate this process um, you, um, you leave out each and every sample in every given iteration. And, and you do it for 100 times, and then you average the performance of a classifier over these 100 times. This is called leave one out cross-validation, which is a bit um, uh, called intuitively. Leave one out. So now this slide summarizes all of the steps that I just described to you. Um, this is a more detailed strategy for development of classifier. So we have our training set. We build a classifier. We do a um, cross-validation here using our training set. Then we um, evaluate performance of classifier on independent test set. And all of the um, um, 
error rates that come from these three uh, directions here shown with arrows basically define our performance assessment. So, and certainly I have to know that resubstitution error rate is a bit more optimistic because you are testing your classifier on the same training set that you have built it on. And so the more realistic one would be the test set error here. And cross-validation error rate is also relevant. So usually when you read the literature, you would uh, see both uh, cross-validation and test set error, um, uh, error rate um, uh, noted in the literature, which are most uh, relevant. And another comment here that um, both learning and test sets have to be identically distributed with regard to um, representation of, um, um, of tumors, so with any given characteristics, and uh, distribution of characteristics of patients. So if, for instance, you, uh, in your learning set, um, you have, say, the ratio of responders versus non-respondents of 1 to 3, it would be good if you would have the same ratio in independent test set. And it is very often hard to achieve, but it is possible. And then other factors such as age and race and status of certain hormones that can uh, be important for any particular disease or a mutational status of certain oncogenes have certainly uh, have to be um, identically represented in both learning and test set. And that's a very important point because if that is not true, if these conditions are not met, then the uh, classifier evaluation <coughs> will be inadequate. And we certainly do not want to do that if the classifier is to be uh, moved further to clinical applications, trials, and so on and so forth. So now I will describe to you rock curve. I don't know, have you been introduced to rock curve during the course before? No, okay. So uh, the rock curves or receiver operating curve, uh, these curves are commonly used to evaluate performance of classification method in comparison with other existing methods. And so basically, um, 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 this um, basically originates from signal detection theory. Uh, and originally, the name comes from the receiver operating characteristics. We call it just rock curves. And so basically, what are the rock curves? It's a uh, graphical plot of the sensitivity um, or a true positive rate versus false positive rate or one minus specificity for a um, binary classifier system um, as its discrimination threshold is the ride. Now I will explain to you what, what this means. So um, now um, the classification model, classifier or diagnostic test, is basically a decision of where to put any given patient into which class, whether the, cl the patient responds to therapy or doesn't respond, or whether this is a tumor or a benign tissue, for example. Now, the classifier or, di or diagnostic uh, result can be a real value, continuous output, such as gene expression value, um, in which the classifier boundary between classes must be determined by a threshold value. For instance, uh, to determine whether a tumor has uh, expression of corresponding gene and where to put this threshold of calling the gene, say, overexpressed or normally expressed. So this threshold can, can vary. Uh, <coughs> now, a rock space for a rock curve here is defined by the false positive rate and true positive rate as x-axis and y-axis. So this is false positive rate here and true positive rate there. Now this is called a rock space. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
and basically um, this is the diagonal line is a no discrimination line so everything above is a classification method that works uh, everything that is goes below the no discrimination line means that the method does not discriminate classes now the point of interest is this one which would be a perfect classification so um, which means basically um, uh, you know a hundred percent true positive rate and virtually zero percent of false positive rate and now this figure shows you an actual data that compared a number of algorithms and you can see that this is the best um, the best performing classification method compared to the rest. Now how do we use this rock curve? So the purpose is to find first of all the best threshold for discrimination so say for example value of our gene expression, our classifier and then the second is to compare performance of different classifiers. So now I have described to you how we compare performance of different classifiers. I will elaborate on the threshold to be used with the next slide. Another um, point uh, to make here is that um, the usual summary of the rock curve that people often use is the area under the curve, which is this area. So basically the larger the area, the better, and the maximum is one. So that's what you will commonly see in the literature the comparison of area under the curve. Some weird folks prefer to use the area above the curve, which is the less the better, but um, the most common thing is the area under the curve. Uh, question. So, if, so if you're using area under the curve, I guess that's good as a sort of a general measure, but if, you know, I'm, I'm actually, since I'm looking at that, um, <coughs> It's like sort of one of the curves kind of overlaps and goes out. So it might actually perform better mm -hmm. depending, in, depending mm -hmm. on how you choose your, your threshold. threshold. Yes. 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 And so then the threshold basically is also an important thing to to select because then um, by constructing a rock curve, uh, you can choose a threshold that will give you um, a best combination of true positive rate and false positive rate because you know in some applications you may favor uh, for instance uh, false positive rate so you would like to minimize it and with a certain uh, with the trade-off of losing some of the true positive rate and so and I will show you how this is done yeah, on, on the next slide So, um, so now this slide shows you how um, the rock curves are constructed. So uh, basically, um, we have two classes, two groups of patients, responders versus non-respondents, for example. And they have the distribution of a classifier value in this case gene expression for example I, I apologize this is an additional slide that I just recently put because I thought that the just one slide on rock curve is not really explaining how the rock curves are interpreted and so I just added the slide today so my apologies it will be posted on the um, on the site of the course and so um, you will be able so this is just a simple cartoon that explains um, the usage of a threshold behind the, uh, the process of constructing of a rock curve. So we have two classes and they have distribution of classifier value. Okay, so for example gene expression. And this is shown here. So we have one class here and one class there. And they certainly may overlap. So now this is a given data to us which does not change under um, given study, say, right? So now it is important to find a threshold for a given classifier measured uh, value to call the sample either class 1 or class 2. So where do we put this threshold? Do we put it here? Do we put it there or there? It's, it's really hard to decide. And so 
what we do is that we um, put a threshold here, for instance, which gives us this uh, number of true negatives, this number of true positives, false positives, and false negatives. From this iteration, we construct the confusion matrix with our numbers there. And then we can compute our uh, false positive rate and true positive rate out of the confusion matrix, and we get a single data point on the raw curve. Then we go back again here. We shift the threshold a bit to either side. So basically, you can start all over from here to there, depending on how comprehensive you want to be. So you move the threshold, and then you get different um, numbers of true negatives, true positives, and you construct another confusion matrix. You derive um, another set of false positives and true positives, and you get another point on the raw curve. So, and that's, you iterate this process many, many times until you get your raw curve of desired resolution. And basically then, um, uh, you will understand how you can use the raw curve here uh, to decide basically what false positive rate you can tolerate and what true positive rate you want to get. Is it clear now how the raw curve is constructed? Have questions? Just disregard them. It's, yeah, disregard them. No, 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 no. It was just an annotation for another figure, so just disregard this. The the main point from here is the discrimination line and important points here. Uh, you have a classifier that you do locally, and for that specific classifier, you know what the true positive and false positive rates and the false negative and true negative are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, in a given uh, setting, it gives you only a point in the space so mm -hmm. around here. Uh, yes. And you describe an iterative process to get some other points so that you didn't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How you figure out those points? Uh, you build another classifiers? No. No. So let me show you this. Um, where was that? Uh, yeah, here. So see, um, when you build a classifier, basically you binarize a value for a classifier. So you decide, okay, I'm going to apply this threshold and I will call this gene upregulated if it's above the threshold or downregulated because it's, you know, below a certain threshold. So, and see, so, but at the same time, these two groups, this and that group, see, they have variation of the expression of those genes, okay? which results in that distribution that I showed you on that explaining um, slide. Okay, here. Okay, so originally you start with a setting threshold somewhere. You build a classifier and you get your accuracy and classification rate on that. But then you construct a rock curve. So first you can compare um, your method with another method and see how the overall curve behaves. This is one purpose of a raw curve. And then once you're satisfied with your method, you can use your raw curve to um, choose the best threshold for your classifier. What Where to put the threshold? Threshold, um, uh, when we're talking about gene expression, that's a threshold of, say, overexpression. Yes. So the gene should be expressed at this level in normal tissue, and it should be above the threshold in cancerous tissue. So where do we put this threshold? I can, I can figure out that for root-based methods that use a single gene, let's say. Mm -hmm. But in case of uh, more complex uh, classifiers mm -hmm. by some of the machines in which you don't know any explicit rule in there, let's say, but we know that, for example, for a specific configuration, the samples are classified into, for example, cancerous forms or healthy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
there is a classification model which is complex itself. Uh -huh. you know, what's the threshold in such configuration? Are you repeating your algorithm again? Yes. Uh, yes. But what and you're constructing your confusion matrix. But what parameter are you changing? You're changing the expression of your genes in your classifier. So you, uh, you're changing. Uh, I'm sorry, not the expression. I'm sorry. So you have, uh, you have a. Uh, so, so again, so you have your group one of patients which are say normal, and then you have your cancer samples, and this is say the distribution of expression of your classifier gene. Okay, so certainly you don't have all of the samples within group one showing exactly the same value they show, normally they show distribution. And the same for group two. Sometimes uh, these two distributions overlap. This is a very often the case. And basically the, uh, the amount of overlap results in the shape of the curve. So, and then, and then it is a question, where do I put this threshold? If I put this, so most importantly, if, if I change this threshold, it will change my uh, false positive rate and true positive rate. Because it comes from, from this part, see? I think all that setting needs to use the only one feature or if you have only one gene. If you have multiple genes in the classifier, you consider them all. You summarize the um, uh, classifier uh, data in some way and then, and then you use it for this to build a raw curve. So you basically consider the distribution of sin signal of a gene expression signal uh, for all of the members of your classifier. Okay, so now um, if you plan to move into classification and discrimination research project, I think it would be helpful to read these landmark papers that uh, were published over the last decade. Um, these are um, more or less um, correctly um, um, uh, made uh, studies um, and they concern different cancer types um, and as you see um, um, they use slightly different methods so you can get familiar familiarize yourself with uh, what kind of um, um, research um, strategies one may take with regard to the classification and discrimination um, uh, questions. So these are the papers that I highly recommend you to look through. So um, <coughs> this course is devoted to cancer genomics um, and a big component of it is development of biomarkers of different types. Genome copy number, gene expression and so on and so forth. You have heard um, about classification of cancers into subgroups um, using all aforementioned molecular profiles, which is probably the uh, most common research question in this field. Now, what I want to do now is to introduce you to another equally important research question, um, which has been receiving more and more um, attention recently, and is certainly an important part of translational research in conjunction with clinical trials. Uh, and that is the predicting the response to therapy or drug response studies, as they commonly called. <coughs> um, this often involves the same uh, classification um, problem, as I described before, such as whether the patient will respond or not to the given therapy. But in the, in the reality, there is a number of subtleties in, in this kind of uh, research um, study that makes this research field a special case. Um, so this slide summarizes the idea behind this research question. So uh, when drug is applied to a cohort of patients, uh, what we normally see is the spectrum of response. And the spectrum um, uh, is composed of response values as measured by the response evaluation criteria which can be binarized, as it's shown here. So instead of the um, um, spectrum of values, we get a binarization of um, resistant 
tumors, say, versus responsive tumors to any given therapy. And this is most often done uh, in the research. Um, and then application of the classification rule gives markers of response, um, um, as it's shown here, um, that are further tested on the independent test set of patients, which is shown here. So now this can be a classification <coughs> problem when you work with the binarized data here and the your prediction is also a binary prediction whether the patient respond or not respond to any given therapy and in that case this will be a classification problem now this can be also a regression problem where we will try to predict the actual well we predict the amount of the response or response value so this involves, this does not include the binarization step of the data, um, and it deals with the uh, spectrum of um, uh, response values um, without binarization. So now uh, this diagram shows again the ideal scenario, as I mentioned to you, when we have two independent sets of patients, their samples. Um, that one is used for training classifier um, and then um, tested on independent set of patients. So um, this is certainly an ideal scenario which uh, doesn't happen that often, especially for the drug response studies. So um, what can happen is that for building predictor, we may have patient samples and for uh, evaluating the performance of our predictors, we may also have um, patients' uh, samples, and that is ideal situation. Now, we can build our classifiers using cell lines profiles representing a given cancer type, and then we can use patient samples to evaluate a performance of um, uh, predictive markers. Very often, people are given with the mixed cancer types as the training set. They build classifier on the mixed cancer types cohort and then they test the performance of classifier on a single cancer type. And that's unfortunately the reality. That's what people are, um, that's what they have uh, in their hands. Then another scenario that happens often is that classifier is built on the data set of patients treated with combination therapy and then they're trying to evaluate the uh, predictive performance of the markers on the patients treated with monotherapy and vice versa try to build the um, classifiers on patients with, treated with monotherapy and then evaluate the performance on patients treated with combination therapy and this brings in a lot of um, complications and challenges with regard to um, this type of uh, research study. Also, uh, there is another complication um, when it comes to the response. One may use different metrics. And so for cell lines, it can be, for example, the uh, GI50 or CI50, IC50, then TGI or LC50. These are usually concentrations of a drug that result in, say, 50% of inhibition of growth of cancer cells or uh, reduce the activity of a target by 50%, for instance. Um, then this is what's commonly used for cell lines, which is a common um, model system for preclinical pre evaluation of uh, a given drug. Now, when it comes to patients, the um, criteria also can be uh, quite different. It can be uh, a time to the progression of the disease. It can be overall survival. Um, then it can be arbitrary assignment based on post-treatment tumor volume. It can be pathological complete response. It can be residual disease, whether it exists or not. It can be complete response. Or it can be, it can be even incomplete response. And 
Uh, if you're curious, the definition of these are given on this table. So obviously, um, different metrics of response can be used in patients in particular. And it's, it's important to, first of all, choose the most appropriate one. And um, for, it, for uh, any given drug or a, any given patient cohort, and very often it's not the same metric that can be used throughout many studies. And then what's also important is to be consistent throughout uh, individual sets and across studies when one is to compare the performance of a classifier. So for instance, um, when somebody uses a um, patient's cohort to build a classifier and they use a um, uh, time to the progression as, um, as the evaluation of response. And so, so uh, when they test the classifiers on some other patient cohort that is published by someone else, it is important to use the same metric. So that's very important. And so that's uh, the major note from here is that um, uh, what's important for their performance evaluation um, uh, of um, predictive markers especially uh, when one goes across the studies, is, is, to, is to be consistent with this in the first place. So cell lines are widely used for um, preclinical studies um, of drug response. And they are invaluable resource. Um, there are certainly um, pros and cons um, uh, related to cell lines. So the pros uh, include uh, the fact that cell lines are more readily available in patient cohorts. They are pretty easy to manipulate, and certainly they have unlimited supply. And very often cell lines are quite thoroughly characterized models through molecular profiling and uh, uh, other aspects. Then um, cell lines enable prediction of response to novel therapies single or combination because basically we have only limited number of patient cohorts in clinical trials, for instance, um, that are treated with a certain drugs. And so if one is to test the response to a new drug, then certainly we need to um, uh, resort to our model system, the cell lines. Then cell lines allow high throughput screening of thousands of new drugs, and that's what uh, um, the NCI 60 panel has been created for, that I will mention a bit later. Um, then it enables identification of new uses of established agents, um, such as to go across cancer type and test if any given drug approved for one cancer type will still work for another cancer type. And also it certainly provides a, a way to inform us um, about possible mechanisms of drug action. So we can manipulate genes that we find to be associated with the drug response, and we can uh, uh, investigate the uh, functional role of those genes and effect um, on the drug response itself. But also, cell lines are associated with a number of cons. And um, these include um, the fact that the cell lines represent a small and highly selective minority of heterogeneous tumor population, and they're not available for all the cancers. Then cell lines are um, 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 specially selected and adapted for cell culture conditions and may not respond similarly to the drugs uh, as cancer cells grow in a human host. And um, just to give you an example, for instance, um, we do see differences in expression of transcripts in cells grown in 2D versus 3D even, not to mention the microenvironment of tissues uh, as it happens in the human body. So this is, this is one of the um, uh, very important uh, drawbacks of cell lines. Then drug exposure in vitro does not mimic the uh, kinetics of drug exposure in human tumors that are influenced by interstitial pressure, blood flow, drug metabolism rate, and other host factors. So we're not, um, we're not addressing these questions here. Um, and then validation of signatures in patients uh, are difficult because most clinical efficacy trials are carried out with drug combinations. And, um, and uh, it is not um, always possible to find a ready-to-use data 
for um, cell lines that have been treated with this particular combination of drugs. Usually it is a screening for a single uh, drug agent. So now um, um, this is uh, a slide that shows um, a model system for screening a drug response. This is an NCI 60 panel. I'm sure you've heard uh, quite a lot about it. Um, I will just tell you that um, um, basically uh, this is under the developmental therapeutic program at NCI who has established a collection of 60 cell lines uh, representing a handful of different cancer types. And this initiative started um, somewhere uh, around 1990 and has been uh, widely used as a high throughput resource for a resource for high throughput screening of multiple drugs. And so basically the capacity is, is that um, uh, it is possible to screen up to 3,000 drugs a month with this um, platform. And at this point, there's a very rich data available on this site which um, includes more than 100,000 individual drugs uh, screened um, with this panel and is available as a public resource for everyone to explore. So now, uh, various gene signatures and sequence alterations in target genes have been obtained for a prediction of drug response in patients. And there are a number of examples um, that include um, uh, the um, EGFR inhibitors and um, a number of other um, well-studied drugs. And this table shows you um, the number of studies that have been published out there devoted to the development of predictive markers of response in patients using patient cohorts. Now. Um, the, the big disadvantage, actually, of these types of studies using patient um, cohort um, uh, relates to um, the limitation in the number of chemotherapeutic drugs that can be tested. As I mentioned, there is only this number of drugs that are being evaluated in clinical trials. So now, to circumvent this, many groups um, have been using preclinical model cell lines um, to um, make use of human tumor cell lines and xenografts to investigate um, gene expression profiles that are associated with a uh, response to therapy. And um, this can be done, as I mentioned, to hundreds or even thousands of, uh, of drugs. So now what I'm going to do, because this is um, a highly developing area in bioinformatics and in the um, clinical research, um, there is no established set of rules that um, um, that one can follow to make the study successful. So um, a number of algorithms are still being developed and people also working on the um, uh, processing of the drug response uh, curves themselves to find um, the best suited way of pre-processing the data uh, and application of a classification algorithms in a more effective way. So what I will do, I will just um, show you a few examples of um, uh, research um, papers that have been published out there and you will see how diverse the clinical research can be when it comes to the drug response studies. So. Uh, for example, the group at MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, a um, program on pharmacogenomic marker discovery, um, which goal is to study uh, the treatment of breast cancer with uh, combination, combination T-FAC therapy. And there was a number of paper that originated from, from this group uh, since 2004 till up until recently. And I will just show you a couple of these to illustrate what people can do with this type of data. So for example, for study one uh, in 2006, um, uh, the goal was to develop uh, predictors of a um, uh, pathological response in response to combination therapy TFAC, and they used um, some 80 breast cancer patients and validated on uh, 51 independent cases. 
Then they evaluated use of different classifiers um, that you have heard about a bit earlier today, such as SVM, uh, Canon, and uh, linear discriminant analysis, and also varying number of features in the classifier predictor. I, I've gotten a question about this, so you will see how people approach this issue. Then they examined the effect of training set size on model performance, and that is a very sensitive point because um, we are always limited in uh, training and validation set sizes, unfortunately. And so um, it is important to understand what should be the minimal size of our training set so that we can still do a good job with building our classifiers that will give us a acceptable performance. And so they try to take a look at that too. And then they also compare genomic predictors versus clinical predictors. So this is um, the data from this um, paper uh, where uh, they have performed um, a comparison of some 780 classifiers, which included 20 um, classification methods with 39 different sized gene sets or selected features, if you remember the slide that I showed you before. Uh, so this pertains to the classification rule. So the workflow there was that they ranked genes by p-value, um, differential expression, um, and then they do 100 uh, randomized iterations. Um, uh, so what you can see here is the area this time above the rock curve. Remember, this is a complement to the area under the curve, so we want to minimize it. Uh, for an, this number of different uh, classification methods, with this varying number of genes that were included into a classifier. And as you can see, um, uh, there is a improvement in classification as you increase number of genes for pretty much all of the classification methods. And then as you actually uh, continue to increase the number of genes, you can um, see a decrease in performance of your classifiers. And that's because you, you reach the point um, where, where you have likely to have included all of the uh, most informative genes. And then whatever you uh, add in on top of that are not that really informative, but they rather introduce noise, which is just irrelevant to the drug response phenotype. And so that's why the performance goes down a bit for uh, some of the classification methods. So, so here's what they have decided, um, is that this was um, uh, the best performing classification method and the number of um, uh, genes that they um, found to be um, uh, best performing in a classifier was around uh, 40, I think. Yeah, around 30 or 40. So they plot to around 30 or 40 genes. So that's how they basically approach this problem. Now, another aspect, as I mentioned, that they try to explore is the effect of a training set um, on, um, on the prediction performance. So what they did is that they put uh, both sample sets together. They set aside 20 samples for test set, and the rest they used for um, subsampling and training. So they did some 50 iterations and uh, red dot uh, represents the median of prediction accuracy. And so what they could show, as you can see, so this is uh, the, uh, again, area above the rock curve, which we want to minimize, and this is the size of a training set. And as you see, with the increase of a training set, we do see a um, um, uh, improvement in the performance of classifiers that we build on that training set. So, uh, and they were um, um, extrapolating this uh, to the size of some 200 cases, and they decided that this would be only marginally better than the available uh, number of samples um, in, in the cohort that they had at hand. So this is another way of looking at what training size training set size you are supposed to have in order to make sure that your um, classifier will yield an acceptable performance. So now here's um, um, the evaluation 
of um, the classifiers that they have built in comparison with the um, clinical predictors such as age, tumor, uh, uh, volume, and ER status. So they used uh, LDL method uh, for both types of data. And uh, what they have found, and you can see I have uh, framed it with, uh, with red box for you to see, um, that the 30 pro classifier that they have chosen showed significantly higher sensitivity, but not significantly better um, uh, NPV, which is negative predictive value, uh, than a multivariate clinical predictor. So even if they have done such a thorough work uh, with um, exploring uh, the effect of different parameters on the performance of their classifiers, still the clinically relevant NPV was not really uh, a way better for their classifiers compared to clinical predictors. So this is to emphasize that this is actually quite a tough um, goal, tough research question. So here's um, another study uh, from the same group, a more recent study, and the motivation there was to investigate um, um, to at what extent the cell line derived markers uh, can predict outcome to drug response in patients. And this is still a big question, as I mentioned to you, and uh, actually I would say that there is still a split in the research community um, by probably by half. Half of people do believe in the utility of preclinical models such as cell lines and xenografts and the other half, well maybe slightly less than half, do not really believe that and say that uh, tumor microenvironment play really um, a uh, pivotal role in um, biology of cancer cells. And so this is not directly translatable, the knowledge that we get with model systems to patients. So they've tried to investigate this um, uh, question. And so the way they did it is that they had a cohort of breast cancer cell lines, uh, which were screened for response to individual drugs, such as those ones, the paclitaxel, uh, fluorouracil, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide. <coughs> and then they derived signatures, um, uh, uh, were evaluated on some 130 breast cancer patients now treated with a combination therapy TFAP, which included all of those individual drugs. So let's see what they've gotten there. So the method they have um, um, applied was as follows. So they assigned cell lines to sensitive or resistant cell lines based on the um, GI50. And unfortunately, only paclitaxel uh, had clear dehydomous GI50 distribution. So for other three drugs, they arbitrarily selected cell lines at extremes of a distribution of GI50 values for cell lines. Then how did they find informative genes? In two ways. They tried to see the differentially expressed genes, um, and they were followed by significant p-values. And then they tried to correlate gene expression with GI50. And then they constructed multi-gene classifier using LDA to predict clinical response. What clinical response did they use? Pathological complete response as one, and residual cancer burden as the other one. So what did they get? Result mm -hmm. is that they did not develop cell line derived predictors to four individual chemotherapy drugs that could predict uh, response to a combination therapy in patients. As you can see, I'm sorry, as you can see here, um, uh, what, what, what you can see is, is that um, basically um, uh, the accuracy here is not that particularly high as you see. See, so it's, it's only some 60%. So what's, uh, what's the, um, basically the outcome of all of these studies that have been conducted um, over the last many years? And the answer to this is unfortunately they have raised many more questions that they have provided answers. So for example, uh, there is still a huge question, can human cell lines be used to predict response in patients? Is the commonly used IC50 
the best metric, or should methods be developed to account for all data points in the response curve? Now, what is the best measure of response in vivo? And I have uh, listed a number of different metrics that one can use. So there is still no consensus as to what should be the most appropriate thing. Uh, what is the best way to build predictors of response? What is the best classification rule? And are the signatures of response um, to cancer type, um, are they cancer type specific or can they be applied to other types of cancers? So unfortunately, this is still the questions that still need to be answered. And here, I would like to um, um, familiarize you with a very um, uh, famous study from the Duke University, a controversial study um, that was um, uh, conducted by Bioinformatics Group at the Duke University, which has resulted in a number of publications over these years. And basically, um, um, I will show you what was happening with this. It's actually quite interesting and quite educating. So. Uh, in 2006, the, the group has developed a method um, um, that was able to build promising predictors of response from NCI 60 cell lines and validated on patient tumors uh, to the following drugs, uh, fluorouracil <coughs> plus epirubicin, cyclophosphamide, and a couple of others. And as you can see, the sensitivity, specificity, and PPV and NPV are really extraordinary. So then this approach was named by Discover Magazine as one of the top six genetic stories of 2006. Now in 2007, uh, they used the same approach to develop signatures of response to cisplatin and pemetrexid. This spawns a clinical trial to assign subjects to either of these uh, two regimens of therapy using a genomic-based platinum predictor to determine um, sensitivity to chemotherapy. Now, in 2007, they provided a validation of the combination approach, um, um, and they um, tried to predict uh, the patient's response to two alternative therapies, TET and FEC. And this report is um, becoming a sub-study of the European clinical trial now. In 2009, they used the approach to construct a signature for yet another drug. And basically what you can uh, see from all these publications is that here's the method that gives you good predictions and in independent test sets, has some biological plausibility, appears to be giving stable results over years of application, and is consequently can guide treatment. So now what happens next is that already in 2007, we start to see a certain criticisms of the Duke predictors. And back uh, at that time, it was put very mildly that um, uh, the method, such as the analysis that comes from um, the Duke University, um, has to be absolutely clear to the reader so that others can check on these der uh, der derivations. And then it was noted that the method seemed to be uh, performing pretty well, but it's rather convoluted. And not uh, many researchers can actually reproduce it. So now in 2008 and 2009 year, there was published a devastating rebuttal by um, biostatisticians at, um, um, I forget now where it was, um, I think at the same MD Anderson, and they have found a number of fundamental flaws of all in, in all of these publications. And these were very often absolutely simple flaws, such as both sensitive resistant labels were reversed, the incorrect use of uh, uh, duplicated samples, such as off by one indexing error affecting all genes reported, the inclusion of genes from other sources, including other arrays, um, for example, the outliers that have been uh, said to be excluded from the analysis, and then they would report in drug A to include a heat map for drug B and a gene list for drug C. And these results are, you know, were basically evident 
upon a visual inspection and just simple counting. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There were a lot of other problems related to this. So, um, and then certainly it resulted in the termination of a clinical trial and um, papers from Science and Lancet Oncology have been retracted. So this is actually quite a painful experience. So now, but what's important is that um, now this has basically resulted in the emergence of a very interesting area which is called forensic bioinformatics. Um, where uh, people are now trying to evaluate the um, studies that are published out there and to monitor the correctness of the conduct and interpretation of the results from these studies. And so, for instance, these people have evaluated a number of uh, publicly um, available studies, and what they have found is really astonishing of 18 quantitative papers published in Nature Genetics in the past couple of years, reproducibility was not even achievable in principle in 10 out of 18. This is really, really devastating, I should say. And what they have been able to find is that most common errors are indeed simple. And unfortunately, most simple errors are very common. So, now, there are really um, a number of challenges that are associated with the development of markers, which I have um, um, illustrated to you um, by these few examples and uh, problematic controversial studies. And that's truly a problem which is still being addressed. So people are trying to find uh, the best way to address these problems. But one should be aware of these um, before approaching the research um, project like this one of all of the uh, hidden pitfalls uh, and try to avoid them if possible. So um, now, as I already said, um, many predictors have been published and with a very bright um, uh, performance evaluation such as sensitivity, accuracy, specificity, and so the problem about them is because they are poorly reproducible due to the problems of uh, poor study design and um, not incorrect study conduct and interpretation. Um, now, only one factor should be changing between compared groups, such as treatment of infectious organisms. Uh, and that is something that I mentioned already before, that um, training sets and test sets have to be equally distributed. So you have to have all other parameters more or less constant um, and equally distributed into um, in, in individual um, uh, sample sets. Uh, and then certainly the method description should be detailed enough for reproducibility and correct interpretation. And so people now are um, um, saying that there are three major, basically, threats to marker validity. And I will just touch upon that very briefly for you to be aware of. And this is, this is a chance, generalizability, and bias. So chance, uh, so all of them are summarized in this table. And um, I will just briefly walk you through this. And if you want to get more details, you can uh, read through this paper, which is a very nice paper, I think. So the chance is a type 1 and 2 type error. Type 1 error can cause the erroneous or false positive conclusion that there is a difference between compared groups when there is no difference in the reality. Type 2 can result in the false negative conclusion that there is no difference when a difference um, in the reality exists indeed. Then another problem which is quite a common problem is the overfitting. Uh, when we assess a large number of possible predictors um, and find a certain pattern that fits per perfectly but it can it can be found just simply by chance because uh, now the model basically um, models the noise more than the actual data. So now the generalizability, so what's the solution to this uh, threat again? Is to increase your sample size. As I keep telling throughout the talks, uh, this is very important. 
um, the greater size you have, the better. And uh, there are certain ways of trying to estimate your power um, when it comes to the selection of an appropriate sample size. And these are nomograms that you can um, see, for example, for prostate cancer that can help you with this. And then another very important thing, as I mentioned to you, to reduce um, this threat of a chance is to check the reproducibility on a dependent set. And certainly, if you have more than one independent validation sets, is a way better than just having one, because you can always have a certain bias within a certain any given uh, patient um, sample set. Another problem is the generalizability, and it concerns to whom the results of the comparison um, can be applied. For example, comparison of test results in people with cancer and people without cancer. So the generalizability of a study depends on characteristics of participants and how they are selected uh, regarding age, gender, symptom status, hormone status for uh, reproductive cancers, and so on. So what's the solution for this? Markers should be assessed um, uh, similarly um, to clinical trials uh, in three phases. And um, in particular here in this paper, um, there is a proposal that suggests that initial studies should involve tissues and animals, uh, whereas later ones involve symptomatic and then asymptomatic people. So this should account for the threat of generalizability. Now, the bias is a very important uh, factor and um, is um, basically it's unintentional and unconscious. There are so many hidden uh, uh, variables that can basically um, um, influence um, the phenotypes that you see. And so the bias broadly uh, defined as systematic erroneous association of some characteristic with a group in a way that distorts a comparison with another group. So for example, compare a group with patients with cancer versus um, patients without cancer. Mm -hmm. And the cancer patients um, are older people. They are all, say, over 70 years. And all of the um, non-cancer patient groups are younger people, all of them 35 years. And this is certainly a bias that should be corrected for. What's the solution for this? Uh, the solution is complicated, and it involves making uh, everything equal during the design, conduct, and interpretation of the study, and reporting those steps um, in a thorough, explicit way, so that everyone can review it. So now, briefly, um, um, there are a number of tools. Uh, yes? I haven't read this No, I think not. Yeah, so then that's a problem mm -hmm. because so they're trying to show asymptotic behavior. Mm -hmm. One thing that they're not allowing to uh, increase off to infinity is the sample size of the test. So I would be suspicious of this as well. They're going to grow the sample size. So, so you think that they should be um, a fixed size for a um, validation well, it set? It would rather be a fixed proportion rather than a fixed size. It would be better if they said, let's use a 20%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you grow the sample size. Yeah, you know, that that's a good point. And actually, honestly, I do not remember. So, yeah, but that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay, so this slide uh, shows you the tools that one can apply for this kind of uh, research studies. And um, the R package, which is called CARET package, which includes um, a large number of uh, classification 
regression models. And here on the right, you see the table, uh, which lists um, um, different classification methods, some of which you are already familiar with now. And <laughs> here on the right, you see uh, in the table uh, what kind of research question uh, they can be applied for. Uh, uh, classification and regression, either or both. So most of them can be extended to the regression problem. Sometimes it is it is a problem um, for a particular classification method, so it's not always a simple thing to do. Some of them do not um, uh, are not able to to do the regression, uh, and these are neural networks, for instance. So um, this is something uh, that you can use technically for this kind of uh, work. So now what I want to do is um, to um, summarize what we have learned. So despite the progress in marker development field, still there is a keen need for new biomarkers. There is a large number of classification discrimination methods, and generally LDA, KNN, and SVM methods perform well across studies and in comparison studies. Then feature selection is an important part of classification procedure, which can improve classification performance, may provide useful insights into biology of a disease, uh, and lead to diagnostic tests. Um, another important thing is the performance assessment, which is crucial for classifiers' development and consists of several important components. And the last point is that there are threats to marker validity um, for classifier development and consists of, se um, I'm sorry, um, and transparent documentation is crucial uh, to the study reproducibility and clinical relevance of biomarkers. So this is the material that we have covered. Now this is not over yet, so what I would like you to do next is try to apply the knowledge that you have just acquired to a uh, specific biological questions. <coughs> so here what you see is the question, the biological question, that was um, asked in the first column. Then there is a um, design and result and I also have an explanation. So let's walk through them here. So the first question, does molecular profile shows clusters by survival? So now what the person does is um, select a subset of genes with significant uh, differences between long and short survivors, clusters profiles for these genes only, and gets clusters by survival status. Now, is this the correct analysis? No, this is incorrect. Why? Because genes were already selected by difference between survival groups, so they should cluster according to those groups. Right? Another example. Build a classifier for a rare subtype of cancer with disease prevalence of 0.2 and assess its performance using cross-validation. What, pe what the person does, selects equal number of patients with rare subtype of cancer and common subtype. Disease prevalence of 0.5 now. A uh, classifier um, that the one builds shows high sensitivity and specificity, and then the person concludes that it is applicable as a diagnostic test. It's incorrect because sensitivity and specificity do not depend on the population distributions but NPVs and PPVs do. So sensitivity and specificity are not clinically relevant. We rely on PPVs and NPVs. They should be used for performance assessment. The third one, compare responders versus non-responders with respect to survival experience. So in clinical trials, for example, often patients are defined as responders, for example, by the shrinkage of a tumor and non-responders. Now compare survival experience of responders versus non-responders using Kaplan-Meier curve and conclude that the treatment is useful. This is not correct analysis because there is a bias. 
patient had to survive a certain period of time to achieve response. And we do not know how long would a patient survive without therapy, maybe longer. So the conclusion cannot be made. And journals actually have banned this type of analysis. Now, what I want you to do is try to come up with a correct analysis with regard to this biological question. So does molecular profile shows clusters by survival? How do you think it would be correct to approach this question? Go ahead. Okay, close. The beginning is correct. Okay, so here's the answer. Yes, we do perform unsupervised clustering of genes that are differentially expressed across all of the samples with no respect to the survival group. And then, when we get some kind of clustering, then we can see if there is a difference in survival experience between observed clusters. That would be the most correct approach. Mm. Okay, so then the next one. Build a classifier for a rare subtype of cancer and assess its performance using cross-validation. Just have to make sure that you, you use uh, incidence of 0.2 in your learning set, like 0.2 of the rare disease and 0.8 of the common. Yes, yeah. So you try to correct for differences in distribution and representation of uh, samples in both your training and um, test set. And they should be representative of a population distribution. Mm -hmm. And then you test the predictors on independent set, which is also identically distributed. Now the last one, compare responders versus non-responders with respect to survival experience. What would be the approach to explore this biological question? So we have subgroups of patients, some of which respond to therapy and another group which doesn't. What can we do with these two sets? So here's the answer. We can compare the molecular profiles of these two subgroups, right? And we can build our markers of response to the therapy. This is one thing. And another one, we can compare survival experience of patients treated versus untreated. And this will give us an estimate of usefulness of treatment, for example. Okay, so um, this concludes this part of our module. And this is the list of references that I have used throughout the talk. And you are welcome to use them and uh, to read through them if you want to get a bit deeper. Uh, grasp of, of these topics. So uh, what we'll do is that we'll take a break now